and we're going to contribute more than money. I, I see the big picture from Kenya's perspective, but we're going to contribute more than money. This will be an exchange. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to exchange knowledge with each other. We're not going to assume that we know the best way to do things. And we're going to, through our exchange, we're going to realize that what works in the United States or Europe, the Caribbean, South America, wherever we're coming from, doesn't necessarily mean that the same model will, will work here. It's a fact. Welcome to Black to Africa. I'm Tadre Delora Moignet, a California native living my best life in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for coming along for the ride. I hope that you are informed, entertained, and inspired to Black it to Africa. Y'all, I have some amazing news. And I've got some not so good news. So let's start with the amazing news. The amazing news is that Kenya, President Ruto, has just announced a digital nomad Visa. Oh my God. Yes, finally, finally, Kenya joins in Africa. Kenya joins a few other African countries in its digital nomad visa, one of them being Seychelles, Namibia, and Cabo Verde or Cape Verde as we know it in the U.S. So Kenya joins number fourth in African countries that offer a digital nomad visa. I'm so excited and it's about time. The not so good news is that it has not been rolled out yet. It has not been implemented yet. I went on to the e-visa site last night just to check. It's not there yet. It's not even listed as coming soon. But we hope that within the next couple of months, it will. Keep checking back on the e-visa site. I also have a contact that can assist you in all things visas here in Kenya. So reach out to me. All right, let me break it down. Let's go through. Y'all already know I got my notes. Auntie got her notes right here just so I can stay on track. And of course, I always have my tea. Um, today, I'm drinking Morubaini or Neem tea. Neem, as far as I know, was actually brought to the continent uh, from India by Indians. And I basically drink it when I need to get my eyesight right. When I lean real heavy on my glasses, my eyes get kind of lazy. And the neem tea, believe it or not, strengthens my eyes like immediately. And um, it's called Morobaini in Kiswahili because uh, it means that Morobaini is uh, 40, uh, which basically means that it heals 40 different diseases or ailments. Okay. Mm. It's bitter, but I've gotten used to it. So this week, I literally plan to do an episode on why African Americans are leaving the African continent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think we're leaving in droves, but I've seen a couple of people hop on their socials and basically just say nasty and unfounded things about African Americans and why we're leaving like we can't take it. You know, we're not built for it, that type of thing. And having had two people that I know specifically leave Kenya and go to Asia and go to the Caribbean, I wanted to speak on it. So look out for that episode on uh, next week. Um, I, I literally have a whole script that I wrote back when I was writing scripts for these podcasts about African Americans and visas. And I was going to tie that into today's episode. And I'm glad I let that script rest because I was obviously very angry when I wrote it. This was around the time when I was preparing to go to Nigeria. And I'm like, of all places, of all places, I got to pay to get into Nigeria? We'll leave that for another day and hopefully I'll go through and I'll temper that down. Um, because 
really my goal is not to to tear down anybody or any place this is a love letter to my people and i just want to bring awareness and also inspire and encourage my people uh anyone who's of african descent and not living on the continent to return okay so this visa was announced on wednesday october 2nd so that's why it was so imperative for me to make this announcement or make this episode right away. Very time sensitive information. This visa is recognized as a class N, as in Nairobi. Um, that doesn't mean anything to those of us who operate outside of the immigration department, but I just wanted to put that out there. And I also, also sincerely wanted to shout out and thank one of my listeners, Charles Macharia. Charles, if you are listening, Asante Sana. Because you know, Auntie, I do not watch the news for my mental health. I had no idea. Charles emailed me with detailed information, bullet points, honey, and also eight citations, eight citations, including a YouTube video. And even though I didn't have to, because he laid out all the details, I still went through and read each article that he shared. So shout out to you. Thank you so much. Now, let's get into the real nitty gritty. What do you need to get this digital nomad visa? All right. You got to have a passport. That's a no brainer. You must provide proof of remote employment or freelance work with clients outside of Kenya. Okay, by design, we want to protect the local employment labor market. An assured annual income of five, 55,000 USD. Let me say that again. An assured annual income of 55,000 USD. Most of y'all out there got that. Y'all got that and y'all got that good. Okay, proof of accommodation in Kenya, easy. All you need is a screenshot. Well, we'll see when they roll it out. But usually with my guests, all I have to do is supply my contact information, my address, um, a screenshot of where you're staying, a clean criminal record. Most of us got that too now. And um, that's it. That's it. So we got valid passport one, proof of employment outside Kenya. That's two. Three fifty-five thousand annual income. That's three, and a clean criminal record. That's four. Four. <laughs> Most of us, we got that. We got that. Okay. Now, restrictions. You are prohibited from engaging in employment with Kenyan companies. I kind of went over that already. They don't want you to compete compete with local job seekers. I feel that. So now duration and future prospects. This basically is a temporary residency. However, it's a pathway to long-term residency and potential citizenship if that's what you're looking for. This is a big step in the right direction. Y'all don't even know. I know y'all hear about the nomad visas in Europe and Latin America and Asia. Yes. For Africa, this is a huge step because there's a lot of misinformation out there. The way people was hitting me up because it was, it was this, these reels and memes that were trending on socials indicating that African-Americans, or I should say Africans in the diaspora, those of us who were descendants of, of those who were stolen, were able to come to Kenya visa-free. I went down to the immigration office personally on foot and ask those questions. And in short, they was like, baby girl, no. <laughs> no, no, no. And they sent me to the website and I got to see a list of all the countries that are able to enter Kenya without a visa. They are mostly African nations and I would say a few Caribbean nations. Now, for those of us who are from the United States, we used to have one of the strongest passports in the world. Both Bush administrations and the Trump administration, they were that for us. Now we weigh down on the list. Not at the bottom and actually not in the middle, but it's definitely, our passports definitely are not as strong as they used to be. I hope with this next administration, yes, Kamala, <laughs> um, I hope that that changes. 
I'm really excited about this. If rolled out correctly, and I have some suggestions I will get to, if rolled out correctly, this can be a game changer. And this is what I've been saying. This is what I've been saying. Ruto stated that by creating a welcoming environment for digital nomads, the government hopes to establish Kenya as a hub for remote work while also boosting the tourism industry. This is going to be real interesting because A, those of you might know that I do fashion tours in Nairobi. Most of the people that come on these tours are non-Kenyan. Most are digital nomads. They work in the tech industry. They can work from anywhere in the world. Usually they're tech industry and environmentalism. Uh, environments, environmentalism, environments, industry. Um, the other interesting thing is that when we were having the uprisings, Tourism plummeted. That also meant that my bookings were like non-existent for a few months. It's part of the sacrifice in progress. I'm not mad about it. I'm just stating the fact that uh, tourism dropped significantly for a variety of reasons, but one of them were the protests. President Ruto says digital nomads can experience the wonders of magical Kenya every day while contributing to local economies. I think this is super important. When I bring people on my fashion tours, yes, I do try to get the best deal possible in the least amount of time. I'm not going to stand there and haggle with nobody for 10 minutes and go back and forth over a 50 shilling differential or even a 200 shilling differential because at the end of the day, 200 shillings for my clients is like $1.50. So my goal, my responsibility, my fiduciary, my fiduciary duty is to do right by my clients. However, I also want to pour into the local economy and I also want to support local businesses. A lot of these people are solopreneurs. They're women-owned businesses. That, to me, is golden. Striking that balance is golden. And the digital nomad will need to work in spaces that have reliable electricity. That's not all of Kenya. Reliable water sourcing. I've been told that that's not even all of Nairobi, sorry to say. Ah. Uh, even for people who have means, I've, I've been told this. Um, and also steady and strong Wi-Fi. I have seen in my own neighborhood that they are really strengthening and reinforcing, reinforcing the fiber networks, the underground fiber networks. I have seen that. Also with the electricity, they just been shaving back these trees, honey. They've been cutting down these trees um, to basically to prevent them from falling and disrupting the electrical lines. So I've, I've seen Kenya putting in the foundation to support these digital nomads of the country at large. Um, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, I'm just thinking about, <laughs> we know what it's like to have our neighborhoods gentrified. And we know what it's like to fight for basic things like stop signs on our corners where our babies are being harmed crossing the streets and having to jump through so many hoops and sign so many petitions to have the trap houses closed on our blocks and nothing be done. But then some new folks move in and things happen overnight. Uh, I'm hoping that there's balance in rolling out this, this visa. I'm hoping that there's balance. Um, Kenya is truly a beautiful country, and I haven't even experienced half of it. 
And for those people who decide Nairobi will be the spot where you choose to work from, we've had we have a national park right in the city. Imagine that. You can go for a safari right in the city. I would also highly recommend for those of you who are tropical bunnies, baby, post up in Kalifi, Watamu. Uh, what's another place I would recommend for specifically those of us of African descent? Kilipi and Watamu are my favorites. Yeah. For those of you who love hiking mountainous regions, A, we have uh, Mount Kenya area. We've got Nanyuki. Y'all are going to really enjoy, really, really enjoy Additionally, President Ruto has introduced a new electronic travel authorization. It's called an ETA, specifically for transit passengers at JKIA. This allows travelers with layovers, layovers to step out of the airport and explore Kenya, enhancing their travel experience and encouraging longer stays in the country. A lot of countries had this. I thought Kenya had this. Apparently not. But this is this is key. There have been times where I've had like a 27 hour layover in Germany. Left the airport, got a haircut, went shopping, ate, came back to the airport. Happy camper. Now, I want to go through a list of nations that have digital nomad visas and also those who have something similar, but they're not calling them that, but it basically operates the same. Because as I said, this podcast is a love letter to my people. I really and truly want y'all to come back to Africa. I always say it's 54 countries in Africa, choose one. However, the longer I do this, the more I do consultations with people, have conversations with people, I, I do realize Africa is not for everybody. However, at the end of the day, I want you to self-actualize. And that, that is from my heart center. So wherever you find your peace and wherever you are able to be your full self, I want you to do that. And it's clear to me that um, the United States is just not it for a lot of us. Even for those of us who have quote unquote unquote made it. So I'll start with African nations, Cabo Verde. Um, we also know it as Cape Verde um, or Cape Verde, <laughs> Mauritius, which I hear is absolutely gorgeous. At least as a tourist, I don't know about living there. Namibia, I have, <laughs> I have lived there. I've been told by Namibians that I was in Namibia before it was Namibia. I was there in the late nineties working as a community developer and teacher trainer. Very sleepy, very, uh, it's, it's a desert, so very small population. However, relatively stable economy and very good infrastructure. Yeah, uh, there is some anti-blackness there, for sure. It was colonized by South Africa and then before that Germany. So there is some anti-blackness there, but you know, you're going to get in where you fit in. Asia. Indonesia, specifically Bali, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Europe. I mean, there's so many European countries. I don't think I need to list all of them. The Caribbean, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Central America, Costa Rica, North America, uh, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, South America, Brazil. I forgot those countries who have something similar to a digital nomad visa, but not quite. Uh, Panama in Central America, and then we also have Colombia and Ecuador. This, you know, Colombia is really taking advantage of this special visa class that allows people to work there while not draining on the uh, local labor market. I'm always seeing how Black Americans specifically are thriving in Medellin and in Bogota, and they have a very strong um, African-based population that's really, really rooted in the culture. I love that for us. All right. Now, I have some ideas for implementation. 
implementation is going to be key. And for those of us in the U.S. that have experienced gentrification of the neighborhoods we grew up in, the cities we migrated to or stayed in after college, specifically D.C., Atlanta, um, dare I say, Brooklyn. There's so many. It's really traumatic to see this place that you grew to love and that you built flip. I won't go into details, but essentially what we've seen happen in Ghana, specifically Accra, and what we've seen happen in Portugal and in major Colombian cities and, and also in tourist destinations in Mexico. We can see what has happened when things were not implemented properly. We can learn from those experiences and then really shore things up. So when folks start rolling in, we ready. One of the things I think would be so key in this rollout are mandatory classes. Why not? Why not? They will be online classes, okay? And these classes would cover the history of Kenya, the culture of Kenya, and the economics of Kenya. I see this being a boom for local entrepreneurs as well as larger institutions because you can work with these organizations to roll that out. I've been here for a while and I have yet to read a book on the history of Kenya, the people of Kenya. I've read blogs, but I haven't read a book. I've even been inclined to audit university classes just so I could learn a bit more. The history is rich and it's deep. The culture, we got over 45 different ethnic groups. Some of them are cousins, but distinctively 45 different ethnic groups. Learning about the nuances. There is what's said and there is what is. One of the things that I've had to learn living on the continent is that an African maybe is an American no. The economics, like even just learning about, I went to the museum, uh, what is it? What's the name of that museum off of Kenyatta Avenue? Uh, the gallery? Is it the National Art Gallery? I went there and I learned about the history of coin and paper currency in Kenya. It's deep. It's deep. Okay. So learning about that, but also learning about where to shop, where to spend your money. Because I'm going to tell you right now, expats, we stay in our little tiny bubbles. We only go to Westlands and Mutaiga, Gigiri, Lavington, Kilimani, Kilaleshwa. That's pretty much it for us. Runda, maybe? We, you, listen. I, I am atypical. I venture out to places that, you know, might not be as comfortable, but you got some good deals happening and you really see what's going on. Knowing where to spend your money how to spend your money, um, how much things should cost. I was working with a Kenyan brother, consulting with him. He was trying to roll out a concierge business for expats. This is needed, okay? The way folks is getting scammed, um, and it doesn't even have to be anything fancy. It just has to be organized and consistent. I literally have a client that is trending on TikTok because she went and got her hair done at a salon that I would have recommended to her. She found this place on her own. She did her due diligence. She found this place on her own, but I, I would have recommended this place to her to get her hair done. Uh, and I picked her up for a fashion tour. First thing she said after greeting us was, can you believe I got overcharged at this hair salon. She paid an exorbitant amount of money to get her. I ain't never heard in Africa anybody paying this much to get their hair braided. She made a video on TikTok. It's trending now. I'm a client of this salon. 
I actually reached, after she told me I was pissed, I reached out to the salon. I tried to get a refund or some sort of money back from, for her. They was like, you are a value customer. This is a new service, a new type of hair. This is how much we charge in. Even Kenyans was in her comments. She since turned the comments off and they was like, yep, yeah, that's too much. This, that, and the third. Um, then the owner of the salon called me, had me on the phone for 15 minutes, explaining why they charge what they charge. What I can say from this experience, and now I'm talking to Kenyans because most, most of my demographic that watches this is Kenyans. What I can say is get ready. If you, if it is your desire to create businesses that will support this rollout, get ready. I will also say that those of us outside of, let's say, the continent of Africa, we are accustomed to going online and outing businesses, whether it's through Yelp, TripAdvisor. Here in Kenya, we got Google. People leave reviews on Google. In the U.S., specifically in Canada, we have Yelp. We have a bad experience with any service provider, retailer, we go in on Yelp. And you get enough bad Yelp reviews, ain't nobody supporting your business. And we're not accustomed to, listen, get ready. Prices need to be consistent. This is a this is a this is a demographic that for the most part, especially outside of Asia, certain parts of Asia, certain parts of Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa, we used to the the tag, the prices on the tag, all this back and forth, prices need to be consistent. Uh, anyway. Let's talk about the benefits for Kenyans. The expectations that the taxes paid by thriving private businesses will ultimately contribute to the public sector, growth in the public sector. Um, we'll see. And obviously they're looking for this opportunity to strengthen the economy without the direct need for, for government investment, boost and stabilize the economy. Okay, that's possible. That's possible. Um, though, if not rolled out responsibly, it will just benefit a few people. We see that now with any country that relies primarily on tourism. You go to these countries and it's fine and dandy it's lush and luxe at the resorts. Once you leave the resort, resorts, it's just like Chris Rock, uh, he even had a little comedic bit in one of his stand-ups. He's like, yeah, you go to Jamaica. <laughs> you go to Jamaica. You get to these resorts. It's amazing. Uh, you forgot on the road that you just saw a dead baby in the middle of the road. You know, like I talked about in my previous episode um, in Zanzibar, why I left Zanzibar. Uh, once you leave the resorts, it's um, it's another reality. So I'm hoping that this rollout will really just like really boost, be a boom for everybody, not just those at the top. The potential disadvantages for Kenyans, essentially gentrification, They've also mentioned in some of the articles a strain on infrastructure. I believe that Kenyan, Kenya is doing the best it can to make sure that the infrastructure is really um, shored up. We shall see. So to my target demographic, how do we come to Kenya responsibly? How do we come here and not be the ugly American or the ugly European? First, I want to say that I do have a contact here. I'm willing to share my contact's information. There are 
visas available that are not on the e-visa website. I'm not sure why that is. However, I believe that my contact can help you with that. So hit me up. Also, consultations. I would love for you to book a consultation with me and we have an organic conversation about what you're looking for, what your needs are, how you can come here and essentially integrate responsibly, consciously. And I'll leave you with a spreadsheet of information, contacts, people that you can contact in real time, businesses that you can work with that are ethical. Um, another way we can immigrate responsibly is by employing Kenyans. Now, employing Kenyans and paying a livable wage. This is a very contested subject because what I've seen on socials is people saying y'all are driving up the prices. I want my housekeeper to live well. I want my housekeeper to have health insurance. I want her to thrive. I want her babies to thrive. I want her to come into my home and do her work joyfully. There's that. There's also businesses, entrepreneurs that are going to charge as much as the market will bear. That's not on me. I don't really have the answers on how to roll that out responsibly and consistently. I just, I, I don't. Um, let's use the example, a simple, simple example of hair braiders. So the price for hair braiding, let's say, would be 1,500 shillings to get a whole head of braids. 1,500 Kenyan shillings, that's like 10 US dollars. Okay. You can go into the slums, you could probably get the same braids for 800. That's like $6. Then you could go to a high-end salon and pay like 5,500. That's about... 40, 45 USD. Now you got a whole influx of people off of this digital nomad visa that want, they want them $10 braids they heard about on socials. But now the same braider is charging 10,000. Those of us coming from the States that's custom paying 300 USD or more from braids, like 10,000, we got that. We'll do that. Is it our price? Is it, is, our, is it our problem for wanting the braids? Or is it up to the braider to charge a price that's good for the braider and good for us? Would it be ethical for the braider to charge a price for Kenyans and a price for non-Kenyans? I don't know what that answer is. But I do know, as somebody that used to go down to Kenyatta Market, all the time to get braids because I didn't want to pay the expensive salon prices. And quite frankly, the, bra the braids out of them expensive salons were not as tight. And when I say tight, I don't mean physically tight, but they were just not as nice and neat and technically efficient as the braids at Kenyatta Market. But eventually, I got tired of going to Kenyatta Market because they was overcharging me. I said, if I'm going to be paying these prices, I might as well just go to the salons where they got air conditioning. They got an HVAC system. You know what I'm saying? And I can lounge in luxury rather than being in this little stall here. So, you know, Kenyan business owners is going to have to figure that out. Already, when you go to the national parks, the museums, all of that, you're paying a price that is much higher than Kenyan citizens. So essentially you're you're paying to, you're paying for the maintenance, the upkeep, the salaries and the opportunity for Kenyan citizens to be able to enjoy these parks and these museums. I personally have a problem with that. Um, but it is what it is. Again, how are we going to roll this out to where it's responsible, it's consistent and people don't leave here feeling like they've been taken advantage of. 
because that is why my client went on TikTok and her videos are now going viral. And the only reason why the owner called me is because people forwarded her TikTok videos to the owner and the owner reached out to me. She And the owner is just like, listen, I'm going to contact your client and ask her to take down that video because it's affecting my business. Y'all really don't want that smoke. You can call it entitled. You can call it what, what you want. But I call it generating repeat customers. You want people to sing the praises of Kenya. You want people to say, oh my God, I ha I'm having, I had such a wonderful experience. I recommend it to anyone. If you seriously want to boost your economy long term, and for those solo entre entrepreneurs who are in the hospitality space, y'all get ready. Take advantage of this opportunity. I would, you know what I would personally love? I would personally love a concierge service. Like I said, nothing fancy, just organized and consistent. Can I call? You got a voter rider for me? I inherited my voter rider. I inherited my housekeeper from my homegirl from Uganda that used to live upstairs for me. But most people are just in the WhatsApp groups, on the Facebook groups. How, you know, can you recommend? How can I find? Roll that out. I would love to be able to call my personal concierge assistant and say, you know what? I saw a beautiful piece of artwork at the Village Market Art Fair. And he quoted me this price but I know that he quoted me too much. Please call and get a Kenyan price for me. Yes. That exact situation happened to me. The man quoted me like 7,000 for a charcoal piece on paper. I loved it. I also knew that that was way too much. So then I had a Tanzanian friend of a friend call the same artist. And she spoke her Tanzanian Kiswahili. And that man quoted her something like 2500 per piece. Now, that's less than half of what he quoted me. So she said, bet, I'll take three. The way that man, the way that artist reneged, hmm? the way he reneged and bumped up the price beyond what he quoted me, Ooh, the lack of business sense, the lack of business acumen. So at the end of the day, he got none. And when I take my clients out to different markets, because it's an eclectic fashion tour, we do high end, we do low end, based on your preferences, your interests. I, I sometimes have to tell these vendors, I said, do you want some money or no money? Which is it? And I tell them, I say, give me a price that's good for you and good for me. Come on now. Okay. We're going to employ Kenyans and we're going to pay Kenyans at a livable wage. Okay. We are going to act like we got some sense. I'll admit we are a fiery people. We are a passionate people. I will never discount that. However, we're going to act like we got some sense. All right. Some of these people is in my comments talking about, oh, you sound crazy, you're entitled. I, I think a lot of people just don't have boundaries. I think a lot of people are just accustomed to being treated subhumanly. Is it, uh, am I entitled to demand or expect that I'm treated equally like everybody else? Uh -huh. Come on now. Um, and we're going to contribute more than money. I, I see the big picture from Kenya's perspective, but we're going to contribute more than money. This will be an exchange. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to exchange knowledge with each other. We're not going to assume that we know the best way to do things. And we're going to, through our exchange, we're going to realize that what works in the United States or Europe, the Caribbean, South America, wherever we're coming from, doesn't necessarily mean that the same model will, will work here. It's a fact. When I was doing customer training, customer care training in Uganda, 
one of the things that was voiced to me from a boutique owner, she who had gone to school in South Africa and Canada, my suggestion was that the staff at the boutique wear the product. That way, when the clients come in, we can see how it looks on a real person. That's how it works in the U.S. That is what encourages you to buy. You walk into Kate Spade and you see, or Hugo Boss or whatever it is, you see somebody rocking, oh, give me that. Y'all still show me that. I want that in my size. In the Ugandan context, I was told, oh, no, because of the classism. When her customers come in and they see the staff wearing something, they don't want that because of classism. I can't be seen. <laughs> I can't be seen in the same outfit as the workers. So the owner was like, I would have to create a different uniform for them. And lastly, we are going to come here with the willingness to be humble and to have a high level of relational self-awareness. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Blacks into Africa. If you liked what you heard, please share, subscribe, and leave a review. May you thrive. May you be inspired. May you move with love and intention. Until next time.